interview together. So cool. Okay. I think we're live. We're going to find out here. Um, so I just want to, let me start off by just saying welcome, Dr. Boz, to my YouTube channel. How fun is Woo! that? Well, thank you, Mindy. Uh, I really, really uh, loved our conversation that we started with on your podcast and yeah. have actually thought about it so much saying, oh, that was so fun and refreshing. Like, wow, you know, I feel like you say the same things over and over again. So when you hear them said back, it, it, like, oh, there's at least two of us out there saying right. this. That's right. And, yes. and I just want to start off since we are on YouTube, I think we got to start off by just saying... Y'all don't know that YouTube is a whole nother beast to put content out on. It's oh. not like a reel or an Instagram post. Like it's a lot of effort to do these videos, wouldn't you say? Oh my goodness. So what I started out with was first video, I think 2015 was, I was tired of teaching people about how much they needed to learn about sleep. And yeah. your insurance doesn't reimburse me for educating you about sleep. But right. we couldn't get to the next level until I got them through some steps. And, you know, they would, I, I couldn't go forward. So I created a sleep lecture with a handout, put it on YouTube, and like 100,000 people saw it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that is a solvable <laughs> problem. <laughs> and you know what? The algorithm has changed. Like, if you don't have oh, a good story, yeah. if you don't have a beginning, middle, and end, if you're not like yeah. part storyteller, script writer, uh, producer, then you should tap out. I mean, it really is an orchestrated <laughs> event. Yeah, it's really mm -hmm. true. And you know, I had the very similar thing on YouTube where it was like one thing I taught on fasting and it just took off. Mm. And yeah. And the other thing is like the comments on YouTube can be a little like you have to have a pretty thick skin. So yep. You all that comment kindly, we really appreciate it. And those of you that share your stories on both our channels, just greatly appreciate it because it's nice to have some positivity as well. Truly, I think one of my favorite things that I do for commenting back is thanks for the praise. Because yeah. if you, you only reward the ones that are attacking you and, you know, whatever it is that, you know, it's, again, this is a live show. If I misspeak, uh, well, have some grace. I, I don't mean to, but the people who point out and say, I've learned so much, here's my story. So my like favorite thing to tell them is thank you. Yeah, for agree. Yeah, agree. Yeah. agree. So, okay. So for those of you that are just joining us, a couple of things I want to say first, if you haven't followed Dr. Boz's YouTube channel, you know, this, you really need to, because there's just so much information that's so synergistic with what I do here on my channel. So let's start off with that. Second thing, Dr. Boz and, Ari, and I already had a really big discussion on hemoglobin A1C. It's on the Resetter podcast. So the questions that I'm going to ask you is going to be based off of that podcast. Those of you that are listening live, if you have questions, put them in there. My team's there. I'll try to um, get to them as well. So let me let me dive in. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so excited. Like, thank God. I, I'm like, oh, yes. These are softball questions. It's yeah, about they're gonna be softball. Yes. No. <laughs> the first one, though, I have to say is one I love because I love collaboration. Someone said, can someone please explain to me why these Two shouldn't to get get together more than once a month. <laughs> yes, perfect. Right. Yes, I mean, it truly, I, I I can't tell you how many times I've thought about this conversation to say, oh yeah, her her, her people are going to be better off, and my people are going to be better off for both uh, watching these. It's it's really it was really refreshing. So they're right. That should be done. Yes. And, you know, I was just telling Dr. Boz when we, before we got on, you know, metabolic syndrome is a huge mess right now. And we need as many people screaming it from the rooftops. So, um, so I just, I love this conversation. I love collaborating with you. It's super fun. So, you know, in the re in recent weeks, I, I call this my speaking season, mainly because I need permission from husband and children that I'm going to be away a lot on these yeah. events. Right. So from, you know, we went on low carb keto cruise to the keto con to Orlando keto summit. And I, I, I put caps on it like, okay, I'm done. But what was amazing to me was I, I realized that in my, you know, 
dash to get ready to be gone that much. I did not look up much. I was trying to, you know, take care of the fires in front of me and the plans in front of me. And when yeah. you go to these conferences, you really do find that uh, there, there is so there are so many people trying to do this uh, impact most yes. often because of what it ha- what happened to their own health. And then to watch that their efforts need, they need a supporter. They need a, they need a Dr. Mindy. They need a Dr. Boz to just encourage them and say, here's where you left off and here's what I would do next. And I think those places where, um, you know, I, you know, again, encourage, you did a lot of things right. Here's your next step. And then, and then watch to see the feedback over the next 10 to 15 uh, days where they write back and said, here's what we did. Here's what happened. And you're like, that's a win. Well, and this is what I love about hemoglobin A1C is that um, we in the keto movement and the fasting movement, we get so caught on ketones. But what Mm -hmm. I learned in our conversation was how powerful hemoglobin A1C is. And you really are one of the very few people that are out there really talking about the power of this one particular number. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, here was a lot of the questions. What if I'm at like 5.5 and we talked about you know, you said you want to get to 4.5. So what, you know, I, I, a lot of people were like, well, I'm hovering around five, but if I want to get to a lower four, how do I go about do that, doing that? I'm, I'm right. curious. Your thoughts. Well, let's, let's do full disclosure as a preparation for KetoCon. I did my own point of care test as a way to teach my staff. Here's how we do testing. So everybody on the staff got tested and honest to God, I haven't checked my own A1C in probably, I don't know, four or five years. And it was in the fours the last time I, and now, um, well, it's 5.5, which is way higher than I want it to be. But it's a reflection that, yeah, guess what? I'm human too. And moving across the country at 50 with three kids in tow and four businesses, it's taken its toll. I'm not perfect, but let me show you how I'm going to get that A1C down from 5.5 back to something that really is um, is an important place to be. And I think that just opens up the door to say, I do a lot of things, right? I live this life. I post numbers. I go live with my own numbers on a live show and share with you what I do. And even I have had times where I deserve, a, you know, a, a treat. I, I don't like the alcohol sugars. They tear up my gut. So I have real sugar when I fall off of the weight, you know, when I don't go, when I'm not, when I'm eating normal, when I'm just saying, okay, I did go on an actual cruise. Now that wasn't as tempting as it sounds, but truly that human part of behavior is, uh, I didn't go from 4.7 or whatever I was the last time I checked to 5.5 in four months, that's been a four or five year process. And right. so I think the, the the backstory for when people show up and their A1C is somewhere in those low fives and they're like, I'm fine. I'm not even pre-diabetic, which is supposed to be about 5.7, you know, that's pre-diabetes. I, I tell them the key here is as much as we are measuring the glycation or the, the sugar being splat on your hemoglobin, it also splats on everything else. Like in one of the uh, examples I give, uh, uh, the, the gentleman had a, a crick in his neck that always was the first thing to hurt when he would sleep wrong. So he blamed it on a pillow or not sleeping right. But really, if you get down to why does a certain injury recur, um, you can link it to glycation. Uh, another thing he had was tennis elbow. And he knew that if he did this certain part of his job, that his elbow was going to hurt the next few days. Well, why is that? That's because as much as that sugar splat onto parts of his body or onto his hemoglobin, it also splat onto his body. Why, why does somebody with Meniere's disease or chronic ringing in the ears happen more frequently when those A1Cs get higher? Because we're not just glycating your hemoglobin, you're glycating those little bitty bones in that inner ear as well. So when you look at an A1C that, again, is not ideal, it just warns me, you're human, (laughs) tighten it up, get back on uh, track. And, and it's, it's a slow churn. It, it, the average is not easy, but it is also something you shouldn't go, what, six years without checking? I Yeah. And so there's a couple of things to unpack on that. For starters, any doctor that is living the principles that they're teaching in my book is a doctor I want to follow. And 
to your point, we're human as well. And I think the whole goal of health is not to be rigid and, and, and not enjoy life. The goal is to find a lifestyle that works for your long-term health. And what I love about hemoglobin A1C and what you're talking about is that we don't tend to think of the tennis elbow. We don't tend to think of the Meniere's disease. We don't tend to think of I'm not thinking straight as maybe my red blood cells are gucked up with glucose and I should be looking at my hemoglobin A1C. We're not thinking like that. Mm -hmm. And yet we need to be. So right. what would you do if you want to get yours from 5.5? Like if you were to put yourself on a plan for the next month to get mm -hmm. it down to 5.5, what would you do? Well, that's exactly what we did. So there were three of us in the group that had ones that we were, A, willing to share, and B, said, okay, I'm going to make a change. Mine was 5.5. Five. We had one that was 5.7 and one that was 5.4. Uh, I think those are the three numbers. And we all said, okay, in the process of improving people, we talk about, um, you know, I, I call it a keto continuum. And the reason it's a continuum is not everybody shows up to this lifestyle with the, with the baggage of 30 years of elevated blood sugar and what that does do to your tennis elbow and your heart and your uh, the, the amount of pathology associated with metabolic syndrome, inflammatory processes, it goes unchecked. And although as an internist, I can fill about 15 lines full of a diagnosis, what what really matters when people say, how do I correct something is where have you come from? Mm -hmm. So knowing that I've had, you know, probably, I don't know, 30 plus pounds that I shouldn't have had on that were on for a season and then eventually came off. But, but since 2015, pretty solidly in the ketogenic space with a mm -hmm. gradual slight improvement over those years. But on the keto continuum, I, uh, you know, we talk about you know, the first wave of keto being easy where people lower their carbs, they produce ketones, they have this tsunami of ketones feel great. And then your metabolism adjusts to that and you need to provide a stress to uncouple it. So the next place we go, once I can say that they're keto adapted, once their fat hormones are out of the ditch, they're just, they're measurable at least, is we then move on to two meals a day. Eat those, eat those 20 carbs or less, two meals a day. And so I've been past that for quite a some time. I've been at really a four hour eating window for the better part of two and a half years. Um, and in that two and a half years, I had a very nice, lovely, one of my favorites, <laughs> uh, fat filled coffee in the morning, which is something I tell people, you'll get to a certain place where you're not going to see improvement. You're going to need to, uh, step over a threshold. One of those thresholds is, um, you, you, I mean, this, the, the, the headline is you're trying to uncouple their mitochondria, which is out of the sciencey world. But really that means you're trying to stress their metabolism. And you can do that by narrowing the window, but it means that inside that window is where all the calories and sweetener and gum, mastication being really important part of something people don't think about when it comes to stimulating insulin, not in healthy people, in people who've had a problem. And so that, you know, they, they don't start out at a four hour window. We start out at an eight hour window, but we need a clean eight hour window. Meaning in my situation where I would put that coffee inside the eight hour window, that's when the timer would start. And when it would stop, I need to zip my lips. Even if I'm about to serve supper, uh, if you want to reverse the process, you've got to close the window. Right. And so learning how to live inside that window is a metabolic stress. And that's where, um, so one of my, my surrenders. It was about last um, October, actually, that I said, okay, I need to really cut off the calories that I put into that morning coffee because it is lovely for a reason. <laughs> so yeah, I went to black cool. coffee, but still had, you know, treats. Like I would have uh, one of those coffees probably maybe once a week or, you know, in once every other week. Window or in your, yeah. Okay. It was outside my fasting window. So I was cheating essentially. I wasn't really staying in that four hour window. So when my A1C came back, I said, all right, I am human. I got to put back on those window, those edges saying inside the window, I can eat during these four hours. And again, I always uh, really couple that with socially, where does that fit? I mean, when you have, um, I have a teenage boy that has supper with me and I don't want to surrender that he's going to be out of the house in two years. And then I will want for that. So in these times, I'm going to find a, a, an eating window that fits the life I'm in. But you'll know if you are 
uncoupling your mitochondria, if you're stressing them enough by checking some of the, the numbers of a, of a Dr. Boz ratio, of looking at glucose ketone, same time. So I knew that putting back in the window was one thing. And then I have been fasting 48 hours every week, which is a clean fast. Black coffee, salt water is the only thing I have. That also was a graduated process over like a four year journey of, you know, letting go of more and more little kind of habit stacking, taking away one little extra thing until I got to this place. Right. But I really wasn't going past like a 48 hour fast. I mean, I would get to like even a, you know, 45 hour fast. And then I would, I would close, I would end the fast. And so, I could, go ahead. No. So do you, so what I'm hearing just so, because what I want people to, to hear is the concept. What I, what I heard is you keep pushing to that stressor spot. So yeah. you're comfortable with your coffee in the morning. You've got your eight hour eating window or your four hour eating window. You're in that groove, you're making ketones, but your hemoglobin A1C is still not where you want it to be. So right. what, you, what you're doing is you're asking yourself, okay, what can I do to shock the body a little bit? What can I do to stress it so the body has to go under? Is that, is right. that the, the mindset that I hear you saying? Yep. So the first thing I did was clean up the coffee, no more treats until my A1C is where I want it to be. Got the it. second thing I did was instead of that 48 hour fast, I, I had been doing closer to a 60 to 72 hour fast. And even though I don't need to do that every week, it needs to become part of the pattern again for one of those stresses. Got and it. then the third thing I was doing is I used to do a sauna. We When we lived in South Dakota, I had one in my house and I it's just a pain to go to a place to go to a sauna. So I've not been doing that very well. So I've added back that adding heat is another way to stress your system. And especially mm -hmm. if I can do it while fasting, it's a really, it's like double uh, of the stress in that you really do get uh, no calories have been added in. Your body is looking to offset the heat. So you're giving your mitochondria a workout and they are going to have to have ketones available to do that. So it really does bump that metabolic stress that it isn't just even so much if you would be having a continuous glucose monitor and watch what was happening during the fast or right or during the sauna or even the next 12 to 24 hours. But what's powerful is what happens when that little bit of additional stress happens yeah. in a routine process, you can see those glucoses start to lower at about day three or four and that process is a slight lowering. I mean, you really have to be looking uh, to know that you've lowered it, but the trend is definitely downward and it's so, in part because of that stress. So the same, would the same thing be for cold? Like if you do a cold plunge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, you guys, you gotta do it long enough to lower the body temperature though. So like you cannot do this for 30 seconds. Yeah. So have you, yeah how long do you do this? I, I just did it my first one for three minutes and like official mm -hmm. I got in, like I got in a sauna, like a full sauna and then went into a cold plunge. Wow. Like, yes. And, and they just, and I was with a group of people. They were like, you're just going to be there for three minutes. And my mind is like, okay, fine. I'll do whatever I need to do to, for my, you know, that you tell me to do um, for sure. Totally like dopamine high, incredible. Mm -hmm. It, but no, what, what probably I got there in two minutes, like, like that, what, yeah. what I see people do is they get in for like 30 seconds and I'm like, no, 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 no. you gotta, you gotta at least immerse, uh, enough to, to, to lower the heart rate. You can, if you have a heart rate monitor, you can usually watch it. So yeah. three minutes so, is a good goal. But what I love what you're saying, and this is what I don't want people to lose sight of is that this keto continuum that you talk about is so brilliant because you're taking little steps towards better metabolic health. But then the challenge we have for those of us that have been doing this for a while is you get in your little eating window, you get comfortable with your fast, you get comfortable with your coffee, and slowly that hemoglobin A1C creeps up because you're not stressing the body enough. So, right. you know, this is so important because you could be comfortable with one meal a day and it's not benefiting your mitochondria. So you've got to keep switching it. And I mm -hmm. never thought try sauna, try cold to just get those mitochondria to boom back into a better metabolic state. 
mean, for 20 plus years, I've said, oh, they should exercise. That is another place to stress the mitochondria, to push the system. Uh, you know, the little marker that if you do enough uh, resistance training that you're a little sore the next day, guess what? That is a muscle in repair that is mitochondria turned on on your side. Yeah. But you know how many people I've told to do that and it never happens. They do not get there. And yeah. it isn't that I stop telling them. It's that saying that's one of many ways. And when they feel well, I see them doing it. Yeah. But when yeah. you take somebody who's been in the soup of metabolic syndrome or high insulin or obese and then say, hey, go work out until your muscles are sore the next day. They're like, you don't you don't know what it's like to be in my shoes. Right. But if you tell them, go get in a sauna and I need you to break a sweat. And even the ones who say, I can't sweat. I'm like that's a bunch of crap. I'll show you you're wrong. <laughs> Let me show you how the human body works. Go in, break the sweat, hold the sweat for two minutes and start there. And yeah. then there's plenty of way up from that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's brilliant. And I, I, I think it's, we have, I know on both of our channels, we have so many expert fasters, like people are just rocking it. And yet I, again, want to bring us all back to this hemoglobin A1C number, because it is this sign of ox how much oxygen can get to your tissues. And it's so important. And even people like you who are really tightly wound, yeah. dialed in, have to keep stressing it. Like when we get comfortable with our eating and our fasting, that's the time we should be worried. Don't it's you real. Yeah. yeah. And I also just think even when you're in front of these cameras of YouTube, you, I mean, I, I have, you know, what goes on behind the scenes is I'm a mom with kids who like to go to, you know, out to eat and it's mostly keto then. But if that's happening twice a week and it was happening later at night, it was outside, my, you know, then the, the rules, the, the walls start to crumble. Yeah. And as much as the metabolism wouldn't have been affected when I'm 35, well, at 50, it's definitely affecting me. I can tell you in my A1C, but I didn't want to face that anymore than anybody else. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. But I love it. I, lo I mean, again, this is why, you know, those of us that are teaching this and we're living it, we're off. This is our authentic self. We're just people right. really Here I am. embracing this information. So, okay. We had a lot of questions about protein and carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. So what, what are your thoughts on protein, especially when it plays out with hemoglobin A1C and what are your thoughts on the carnivore diet? Right. So I get this a lot. In fact, I think I did about 20 minutes of my last, because uh, this question is, it, it repeats. And when you answer it, you need to hear the longer story, not a glib. Here, you should have this many proteins for this many grams of ideal body weight. It's more than that. When That's why the answer keeps circulating is because the real answer has to do with where are you in this journey of improving your metabolism. If you are in a super high insulin state, uh, like the people who come into the ketogenic diet, I tell them, what the heck are you worried about that for? You need to lower your carbohydrates to a total of 20. You need to make sure that your little ketone strip is actually producing ketones. That state of ketosis is not that far of an equation off from where you've been. Right. And then that, that answer becomes a, a version of that as they progress, as their insulin resistance gets a little less, as their body starts to listen to insulin better. It scoops up the sugar and puts it inside the cell. It stores cell, it stores energy better. And even when they eat protein, which does stimulate insulin, um, you will find that they plateau uh, and they're not having progress. So then they start to say, I'm just gonna blame that old evil monger protein. Uh, and it's not evil, it's like, everybody says I can have all I want. Uh, this book over here says I'm supposed to have so many grams right. <laughs> for body weight. So that yeah. must be the right answer. And they start chasing it, obsessing about how that number is either what the guy says or what, what they don't say. And although I put out some generalizations that it's a pretty good idea to not get too excessive on that if you're early in the insulin state, what I found over the last three or four years is when patients focus on um, how, how, how much time do you spend eating and is that eating window far too large, if they have an eating window that they, they really have the cap ends on, meaning there is no gum, there is no cream in your coffee, there is no alcohol, sugar, substitutes outside the window, then I almost find that there is no way you can eat too much protein. That, I mean, that's almost, that's not quite right. But 
it is so the general rule and the exception is very, very, very tiny. Yep. If they are having trouble with protein producing uh, an insulin response or po protein being converted into carbs, which it's that's not exactly how it works, but that's what the, the lingo gets turned into. Your problem is further up the food chain than the protein number. It is that you are in a bath of insulin. And if you do not reduce the bath of insulin, you're going to you're going to chase your tail saying, well, this guy said it was 1.1. And then I switched to 1.2 and, and they're, it's a ghost there. The answer comes from I need you to stop stimulating your gut long enough to quit it, quit producing that much insulin to quit stimulating it. And I, I do point back to the, the one of the studies that had powderized food, so pulverized, really tiny particle sized food, and they had a continuous glucose monitors and continuous insulin uh, monitoring inside a medical facility. They the first um, the first uh, cohort had um, the infu the ingestion of powderized carbs really easy to find, but that's what they did. Powderized carbs, exact same number of grams. And they saw the insulin shoot way up and they saw the glucose shoot way up and they saw it take a really long time to get back to baseline. And then they had a washout period and they came back in and they said, okay, now we're going to do the same thing with protein. And by golly, that protein shot the glucose up and the insulin up. And although it went back down to baseline a little faster and it didn't quite peak as high, it was significant. Then they had a washout period, they came back in, and then the third time around, they had pulverized fat. And again, it caused a glucose response and it caused an insulin response. So those, the, the, and it did come back down to normal a little faster, and it did not go as high as the protein, and it does not, it, it was like a third as high as the, the glucose. And this okay. is again, both insulin and, and glucose. So both of those hormones, both of those uh, reactions were to pulverized protein, carbs, fat. All three of them caused a response. The take home message is uh, the particle size mattered, processed foods matter. And mm. when you have a protein that you're chewing, as opposed to drinking, you're gonna have less of a, less of a impact for your insulin and your glucose. And when you, when people say I swallowed the protein and two hours later, my glucose was higher, I must be converting it to my protein into glucose. No, that's not what happened. That is not what is happening. Your body's response to eating has a, an association, an association of increasing glucose, even when it is only protein particles inside your system. And we can watch you for every uh, 15 or 30 minutes. They were looking at those numbers over time. So there's way more to it than just saying, because my glucose went up when I ate protein, I must um, be eating too much protein. No, that's not how it worked. How many hours a day did you stimulate your insulin secretion, which has to do with how much did you chew? That's where the gum comes in. That's where mints come in. Don't pretend those don't count. And then how many hours did you rest? Did the gut did to stop? No, nothing but water or black coffee and salt trickling along that GI system. So I've, the, that, that's really interesting. And I have two questions on it. Um, one, were they saying that when you actually chew, you're going to have less of a glucose and insulin response as opposed to drinking like a smoothie? Because that's a, that's a big thing because so many people are trying to get their protein in through smoothies. And then my second part of that question and, and something that I feel really passionate about is the best way to balance out insulin and glucose is not to necessarily look at the macros, but start compressing your eating window as being that motivating thing that will bring it down. Would you agree Absolutely. with that? Absolutely. I mean, the other part of this is when, when you look at the whole patient, when you look at the, the, um, the gal who's been 50 pounds overweight for the better part of three decades, gets on the ketogenic diet, loses 30 pounds, but has this final 20 to lose. And if you would hook her up to a, a, a continuous glucose monitor or even an insulin monitor, you would see that at 4.30 in the morning, she has a, a glucose response from a, a bunch of stored glycogen that didn't happen last week. It wasn't her eating yesterday that did this. It was her mm. eating for the last decade that has a memory inside her liver that says, this is how much we need to store to keep this human alive. And the glycogen storages are 
even when they fast for 72 hours and they get their glucose down to like 56 or 60, it's you know like, okay, now you were in gluconeogenesis. This is what gluconeogenesis looks like. You have a glucose of 55 and a ketone of like three. That's what it looks like. Wow. And then they think, oh, I've emptied my liver. I'm like, well, guess what's going to happen when you eat? Your memory, your body remembers this is the place we store glycogen. And especially the hours spent uh, eating helps to fill that liver back up with a whole bunch of glycogen. So the next morning, su the sun, you know, the earth spins around and here comes that sunrise and your brain says, okay, time to wake up. The signal down to the liver releases a bunch of glucose and you're like, but I, I emptied my liver yesterday. I, I, I had a reset. And I'm like, uh-huh, but not for 30 years. So where they're how coming from matters. So how long does it take to, uh, to untrain that memory? Right. So it has a lot to do with your waistline. Okay. okay. A really big fancy number, here, your waistline. You know, looking at that circumference around the gut, uh, especially when you're, if you're lucky enough, or if you can pay for doing a DEXA scan, looking at that um, VAT number, uh, visceral adipose tissue. So how much of the fat is around your, your middle truly matters for how well you're doing at reverse. And again, it's not a flash flood. It really takes this steady, stable, meta methodical process of, I need you doing the same dang thing 28 out of 29 days. So I need you to pick something that isn't so white knuckle extreme that you fail because that's really where we slide backwards. Right. So, they, so you can pick up an eating window. So let's say I'm eating, um, I want to undo this, this pattern that my liver has. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to, I've been eating in an eight hour eating window and I'm comfortable there. So now I'm going to pick a four hour eating window. And if I do that every day for 28, 30 days, I start to see my waist circumference come down. It's that consistency over time that you're saying will change that liver's memory. Right. Well, so there's a couple of things. So if they're in an eight hour window, I would never switch them to a four hour window. Okay. That well, is, yeah. What would too, you, what, that's too extreme. Uh, the first, extreme. <laughs> so usually people that come to me on an eight hour eating window, they have tried to manipulate of not eating breakfast. Okay. And that's fine. Um, I then double check that their coffee isn't doing what mine was doing, that it is a, whatever hot drink you have in the morning is free of calories, free of substitutes, free of fats. That if you want to count that, then that's when your timer of eight hours starts. So most of the time, the people that are at an eight hour window in this zone, they either have a morning coffee that needs to be cleaned up or their eight hour window starts about 11. Yeah. And I tell them the first thing we're going to do is cut off the evening hours because when you put them into a, you know, I can say continuous glucose monitor, but that, those are pretty expensive. What I usually have my folks do is they're checking glucose ketones in the morning to look at how well do you balance these two numbers out. And I mean, like when you get up to empty your bladder in the morning, don't get off the toilet until you're done checking your numbers. The more you wiggle around and do your life, the more you stimulate your glucose response and I don't have it, my data gets all messy. So sit still, don't get off the toilet until you've checked your Dr. Bowes ratio or check the glucose ketone index. And those two numbers in combination predict insulin. So if the insulin is high, then that number will be high. As the insulin improves, that number gets better. And if you want to see the biggest bang for their buck, let them have, you know, let them say, I've given up breakfast. I'm, I don't, I'm not hungry. I don't want to eat then. I'm like, okay, so let's focus on where you've got some trouble, which is at night. So right. I want you to slide that into a six hour window or maybe a seven hour window. And really, here's the rule. When that, when that seven hours is up, if you are about to lift the spoon to your mouth, I need you to put it down. I really need you to not have anything. Past. You got to get the food in before that seven hours is up or we can't read, we can't undo this. And that because includes drinks too. That includes alcohol or like, you know, your favorite, whatever drink, your favorite diet Coke. Like mm -hmm. we know, we know NutraSweet can stimulate insulin as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think you bring up a really good point. If you're going to try to get that hemoglobin A1C under five, you're going to have to look at these little things. Like what are you putting in your coffee? Are you chewing gum? What are you doing outside this eating window? Yeah, I also think that once they once they identify how hard it is to to take off that hour at night, um, it's it's where that 
they, they really start to look in the mirror. They really start to see, just like I did with an A1C of 5.5, saying, all right, I have some places I should definitely be working on. And right. so it, it, as you watch how well that, uh, and I, I think the feedback for patients is really important to not say, we're going to check your DEXA scan again in six months. And if you have less visceral fat, you'll be fine. Or we're going to measure you in another month and we'll be fine. If I can get them checking point of care, even just three days a week, it, yeah. it says when you eat late at night. Uh, so usually when I have them close an hour off of that window, I said, all right, for seven days straight, I need a Dr. Boz ratio from the toilet the next morning. And I need you to tell me how many hours you went without anything in your gullet. When did you stop swallowing stuff? You know, because they'll always say, but I did. I don't think you meant this. And I don't think I'm like, quit it. Quit playing this game. So the, the Dr. Boz ratio and those of you that, uh, you know, are ha are not familiar with Dr. Boz's work, please go uh, subscribe to our channel and go listen to the podcast we did on the Resetter podcast because we talked all about this. And one of the questions we had was, OK, let's say I, I am. We'll use your analogy. I am on the toilet. I check it. My ratio is good. Now I go to work out. I'm in a fasted state and all of a sudden my blood sugar spikes. So mm -hmm. is that taking me out of this ratio and is it affecting uh, the autophagy? And <laughs> I mean, my yeah. response is you're releasing stored sugar. But I'm curious what you what you think is that right. does that throw my ratio off? Yeah. So again, the reason we're checking a glucose ketone index why are why are these uh, used in research? The Dr. Boz ratio is just you know muddy math for a glucose ketone index where we do research for seizures and cancer, and we are trying to estimate the met metabolic um, rev of an engine with these two numbers. And it is an estimate, okay? It is one of those moments where when uh, when trying to say how well is the, how high is the insulin's impact on the cell, uh, we know that looking at these molecules is a better estimate than just measuring this actual insulin because it is how insulin resistant are they. So by looking at these two molecules, yes, I'm trying to look at the, the most stable moment of the day, which is the toilet. But then when you start to do things to improve you, like you go into the sauna and you're, if you have a continuous glucose monitor, the glucose goes up. Why? Because your body's saying, hey, she's trying to die here. She's in an oven or something, you know, <laughs> that's what it feels like. And that glucose rises, your body then says, we react. We empty out some of the storage from the glycogen. That's the whole point, people. That's what we're trying to get you to do. But now that you're looking at the Dr. Bob's ratio, remember, it's an estimate that the noisier the movement, the less likely it is going to be to predict is, am I really getting a, a, a you know, a, a, a true positive estimate or is this a false positive where it's, it's noisy because of all the stuff you've been doing? Right. So again, the point is emptying the glucose, burning some ketones. That's a metabolic stress. That's what you want. What you and want. don't run away from it because it makes your numbers worse. Right. And I've seen a lot of people who they'll fast or they'll work out or they'll go in a sauna and, and that number goes up. But so does ketones because the body's still like priming its ketogenic system. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's so so don't be don't be if you do an activity, you see glucose go up, but ketones are going up to Dr. Boz's point of view. That's really, really good. So mm -hmm. we're, got a, I always think of it like a sponge. The liver needs yep. to be like a sponge where we're like wringing it out of all that stored glucose. I use that same thing. I use that same analogy. I'm like, that's yeah. a, exactly what it is. Good job. It's like, it's like I used to like sponge my, well, I used to wash my car with like when I was younger with a big sponge. And I think of the liver like that. You're just like, mm -hmm. like right. bringing it all Perfect. Out. I'm going to get a sponge and use that. That's a good idea. Yeah. What do you think of menopausal women and where hormones play into this? Because we did get a lot of questions about that. And we do know the decline of estrogen makes you more insulin resistant. Is there any specific advice we can give menopausal women? Right. So again, I'm 50. So I, I'm near and dear to this right. subject, right? Yeah, I hear when, you. Right. When you watch to see what uh, what is the most uh, let's take men for a second, because I think it's easier to talk about them and some of the mistakes they make. And then we'll come back to women. So I had this man who I'm, I'm, you know, carefully selecting a few people that I want to study on the ketogenic diet. And he is this power building dude from his youth who is now that classic overweight man with a convertible, like definitely has followed through with the syndrome of being overweight and really wants his body to be healthier. 
So he goes to a functional doctor and he gets testosterone because he can prove that it's, um, you know, he's got this blood test that says it's really low. And he starts injecting and by golly, he does feel better for about six weeks. And then he goes back in and they check it again and it's still a little low. So they give him more and then they give him more. And this cycle goes on for about a year where if you study him from the beginning to the end, I bet his lab numbers of testosterone are a little better because you're injecting it. You're putting it right in the muscle. We're skipping all the other parts. But what they did not did not come, they did not address is his six pack of cola that you can see in his car because I, I find him in the parking lot around here. He works near me. And I'm like, yeah, you're going to need to get rid of that if you really want to have this impact of what a testosterone or a fat-based hormone is supposed to do in a body that's bathed with insulin. Because insulin is the dictator. It will tell fat what to do. And mm -hmm. one of those fats is testosterone and estrogen. And so as even though we are injecting it intramuscularly, it's going into his muscles and we expect it to be absorbed. Once it's in the circulation, Mr. Insulin wins. And now it is now becoming part of the storage that goes into his fat. So if I would biopsy or do some liposuction of his fat, we could find the actual carbon molecules of the testosterone that he's been injecting for the past year in his fat. And if he wants to see a rise in his sex drive and his libido and everything a man comes to get testosterone for, well, for heaven's sakes, empty the floodgates of your fat cells. Amazing. So when I get menopausal women and they chase uh, the supplemental hormones, which I don't have a problem with, right. uh, uh, as especially if they're insulin sensitive. Yes, great. Right. So, but if you have insulin resistance, if you have a blood sugar in the morning that's ninety-five and your ketones are in the drawer, I'm telling you, you're 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 not insulin sensitive. That's not what a healthy insulin sensitive person looks like. And until you get that metabolic uh, improvement, you, you are, you're doing the same thing this testosterone junkie was doing, which is take my drug. Yes, you're right. It's easier. But in the long span of what we were doing to that man, we were growing his breasts. We were shrinking his testes. We were not giving him the sexual desires he wants because those all are compromised by having a low testosterone. And he was metabolically stuffing our treatment plan into his fat cells. So That's when great. someone is going through menopause, they put a ton of money, they rub creams on every part of inside and outside their body. And although there's improvement that I'm not arguing the slight improvement, it's to what end and you're focused in the wrong spot. If yeah. you want floodgates opening of, uh, of, a, of a woman in menopause who, if we did biopsies, has estrogen, progesterone, vitamin D, cortisol, all in her fat that should be recycled and used appropriately. And then that will then start to, to do what, what is required of ovarian and testicular function, which is a fluctuation of these fat-based hormones, not what my prescriptions do, which is a level that's stable and, and flat, like, like the, you know, the doctor would give you. Right. So I, I love this. Uh, again, I feel like uh, you're like a kindred spirit in my metabolic pursuit and hormonal pursuit, because what I've always said is that just because you get HRT, just because you get bioidenticals, testosterone injections are really popular right now. These are not free passes. This right. is not a free pass. It's not like you go, okay, finally I got HRT. Now I'm going to feel better. So what I hear you saying is if you take that same medication and you match it with good metabolic health, now you're going to see the benefit of these hormones. So right. would you, would you say for a woman who's like trying to lose weight, she might be on HRT or bioidenticals, get that hemoglobin under five. Are we back? Yeah. The same thing? Right. So we're back to saying uh, the you will be able to measure how well your body's doing. And what's, what's amazing to me is I've had I mean, I've chased the dance around. I need to increase the progesterone, decrease the estrogen. Yeah. What, what you're really dancing around is, well, when we test during that time, what we all should be asking is how high is the stinking insulin? Because yeah. as soon as you lower insulin, the whole equation has changed. And yeah. that that insulin, as you know, people on uh, you know type 2 diabetes with 
100 units of insulin being injected every day, we put them on the ketogenic diet and we have to stop the insulin before they start the diet because it happens so quickly. We can lower your insulin so quickly that instead of chasing your tail around those HRT, really getting, get your own numbers, peonic ketones stuff. It's really cheap. Buy one of those. If you're not peeing ketones, you, then you need to level up to find out what is going on inside of you. And by level up, I mean, what's your blood sugar? What's your A1C? Maybe check a blood ketone if you're if you're in, if you want to get that analytical, but at least be in a state of ketosis. And that is the journey headed for that. And Would nobody. You, okay, go ahead. No, I'm thinking then when you know, you got my wheels turning. Like, so I'm thinking that if I'm going to actually take my, like, let's, let's just throw thyroid medication into this as well. It would be best to take it in a fasted state when my insulin and glucose is down with the time. Well, thyroid is. Yeah. So I, I'd have to check, but I don't think thyroid's fat soluble, is it? It's water soluble. Oh, I don't know, but a lot of people have to take their thyroid with food. So yeah, I don't think that's, I think that's increasing the absorption. I don't think it's associated with fat versus, I can look it up really quick while we're talking. I'll see if it's a fat or, or, or water soluble. And, and, and to, to, so it's a, when it's a fat, fat soluble hormone is what that's I'm hearing. It. And those mm -hmm. sex hormones, uh, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are fat soluble. What yes. about what's cortisol? F fat soluble. So is vitamin D. Ah. All of those are under the rule of insulin. So they play a different game. They play a game of you, if you don't fix insulin, you're just playing with peanuts over here trying to mess with things until you get the insulin doing what it's supposed to, which is very important. We want it to rise, but then it needs to go down again. Right. But that whole syndrome of you're spending, they spend a ton of money and they spend years chasing what they think is going to be an answer when they should just like 20 total carbs, P ketones for three weeks. Give me three weeks. Watch what happens. You right. can lower that and you start to release all the, all the stored, you know, sex hormones that, I mean, by the way, when we look at <clears throat> bioidentical or topical or any other type of uh, female re hormone replacement, that uh, that study first starts with, okay, how much is going to get past the, you know, how, can it get absorbed? How right. much is going to get past the liver? And then in that process of bursting up those uh, fat-based hormones, how much of a clotting risk do I offer? I mean, that's real. That's part of the equation. So you don't want to get too much. You can't just shove it in or you'll have a blood clot. So now you've got first pass, liver first pass metabolism, plus don't peak too high for its risk on the clotting scale. And in that process, if insulin's shouting over it, go, in, go into the fat cells, you take all that risk, you put all that energy and money for this, you know, three hour window where it was effective. And when you start to fast and we and get to a place where I don't mean fat, fasting isn't the first thing out of the gate, get to a state of ketosis. You are right. now unlocking those fat cells. And now all that, that is not first pass. That's going right into circulation, not, not through first pass. First pass comes from your gut into the liver. And then it's right. whatever flows after that. So if you want the fastest in, infusion of your fat-based hormones, open up your fat cells. And right. that gets them a, a long ways ahead. And again, it's not to say that HRT isn't helpful, but right, you're... Right. Yeah, your window yeah. of health is very tiny. But what I love, what I love about this conversation, and this is what I hope everybody's gathering, is that um, we still have to work on our lifestyle. And mm. I think one of the things that we, the mistakes we've been taught by our healthcare system, is that when you get a, medica a medication, the solution has arrived, and you're you're good. <laughs> like we gave you a diagnosis, we gave you a pill, you're good, and mm. then. We're baffled when we don't feel good and oftentimes we're shamed and all those kind of things. But what I oh. love about this hemoglobin A1C number is it can tell you, are you going to, is that medication going to get into the cells or is it going to be stored as fat? Exactly. So, that's I mean, that's <laughs> truly what I, the, I, I love the gentleman who I am, uh, you know, I, I've made fun of him and he is very playful with all of this saying, when you're ready for real help, you come to me. But we're right. going to start with what's going on in your back seat right there. Right. <laughs> and, like, truly. Yeah. He yeah, spends a lot of money and his insurance right. won't cover it. He doesn't have the, he doesn't have a bad enough testosterone for his insurance to cover it. So it's all out of pocket. And his whole hope is that this is going to fix things. And I think that's the, I mean, that's the dishonesty that 
I think physicians like me or in, in, in the world of who enters the ketogenic space, because it isn't right. for sissies. It is, you have controversy here, yeah. but it yeah. truly is. I'm tired of this lie that you think that I'm going to write you for lisinopril and somehow lowering your blood pressure under my medication was ever better than what lowering it due to a healthy body was going to be. Yeah. And yeah, just there's, that. they're just, they're not even in the same universe, but yeah. they are absolutely one is covered by your insurance and the other one isn't. Right. And what I love about the simplicity of what you preach is this one number. Like, let's just all, if we all just go after hemoglobin A1C and we, we all work to get it below five, then everything else, it doesn't matter if you're taking blood pressure medication or you're taking testosterone or, or, or hormone replacement therapy, it's all going to work better. Right. And those of you that are listening to this, if you're not getting that hormonal response from your medication, let's go back to hemoglobin A1C, like it's one number. Let's go mm -hmm. after one number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what a powerful way to say, you know, one of the lectures that I give, it, it goes through, here's, here's the human development from children uh, to adolescents, to young adults, to um, people my age, whatever we're calling us now. It has a new name now that I've arrived. We're, we're, we're newly, newly menopausal women. <laughs> we need a fancy name for us. Right. Damn smart. I don't know. Wisdom Damn show smart. up. Really freaking wise. How about that? I like that. Wise women. Wise women. Let's just call it. I mean, and you look at the amount of diseases that we have associated with an elevated blood sugar, with an elevated hemoglobin A1C. And in children, it's lack of focus, it's poor brain development, it's uh, inattention, it's uh, anxiety, it's depression, it's autistic spectrum. All of these things get worse as yeah. their bodies age, except as they continue to age, they get more severe. We get into that middle adults and now they can't get pregnant. They have PCOS. They're, not only is their hemoglobin glycated or splat with the sugar, their ovaries were. And so are their tendons and so is their eyeballs. And now we get into the next spot where the elders who've been dealing with this high blood sugar for 30, 40 years, they have an increased cancer rate. They have autoimmune disorders. Their immune system doesn't fight off COVID or anything else very well. Uh, their heart disease is worse. Their brains don't work. Alzheimer's is much higher in them. So is Huntington's disease. So is Parkinson's disease. These aging processes are linked to this number. And when you show up at the clinic at 80 years old saying, what do you mean I should improve my A1C? I'm like, dude, we need to just start 40 years ago. And it's heartbreaking because I'm like, yeah, I can help you, but it's a long journey at 80. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. That was so that was so beautifully said. So literally, I could talk to you for hours. So well, we should do this more. We Honestly, need to do this more. I agree. Somebody said do it once a month. We're going to do we should do more lives together. I love this, especially on YouTube. So if you all want us to do it more, just leave it in the comments. And those of you that are following my channel and you're not following Dr. Boz's, hopefully you're going to see you need to follow her as well. And I just, I, you know, when we went into COVID uh, and into the pandemic, I was so encouraged that people were going to finally take care of their health. Mm -hmm. And it got to be such a battle of what was causing issues. And at the root of what we saw was this poor metabolic health. And what you've done for me is really helped me see. And at the root of poor metabolic health is one number, one mm -hmm. number. Let's focus on this one number using tools you teach, I teach, and and we can we can overturn this. So, where where do people find you? Is YouTube your your main spot? YouTube is where I put the most energy. So, yes. uh, bozmd.com is our website. Uh, but you'll find me uh, if you type in Dr. Boz. Actually, it comes up everywhere. So, <laughs> Google me. That's yeah, fair enough. I love it. I love it. Well, you're amazing, and we will definitely talk again. So, just appreciate Thank you. you. Keep shouting that number. I, I'm with you now. I'm, I'm shouting it as loud as I can as well. So you're amazing. So appreciate you.